This is Visions Under Construction. A chance for our guests to share their visions and tell us what they're working on. For their continued support, we would like to thank Simwood, straight-talking, forward-thinking telecoms. Simwood.com. Why not make Cloudonix your communication partner? Go to cloudonix.io. You can find everything about the VUC at vuc.me. Thanks to Bluehost. And thanks also to zipdx.com, the conference bridge, and to voxphone.com for local rate dial-ins. Okay, that's kind of a lie in that you can't find out everything about the VUC by going to VUC.me, but you can find a lot about it. Uh, just like you can't find out everything about Matrix by going to matrix.org. But we got Ben with us. And Ben, um, I'm going to call on you first because you may or may not be time limited. So unmute yourself and say hello. Hello, VUC. How's it going? Hello, Randy. Good to see you, Ben. Who is on your right? So I'm here with Alex Simon from... Hi, uh, I'm, my name is Axel Simon. I'm, I, I'm from La Coelha Chaudinette. We're um, an NGO based in France that defends fundamental freedoms online and in the digital world in general. He's okay. coming by the office just to visit and see what's going on here. Well, I'm glad you did because I want. I am also located in France and I would love you to... Ben will give you my, uh, my coordinates and uh, you need to ping me and we need to speak. It would be great. So our topic today, which I artificially... Uh, <laughs> going to say inseminated, but that's not quite the case. I artificially came up with was that uh, we're going to talk about open source platforms and how they affect. Why is do I have the on? Oh, I see. Uh, let me just remove the I am I voted, which is not really necessary now. There we go. Uh, I did vote and uh, my vote was counted. Anyway, um, we'd like to talk about a lot of things, but we're mainly talking about open source and platforms and things like that. And um, we have known, James, how long have we known Matthew and Matrix? For precisely four or five years, because I first met Matthew at the um, TED Summit in Istanbul. Right. And that Was that four or five years ago? I think it must be four years ago. That was not the Istanbul summit that I didn't make because if we so, we, then we met Matthew way before that. No, that was the first time we met him was in Istanbul. Okay, I met him. Yeah. Anyway, he, he, Matt, uh, Matrix has been on. Um, because we have you here, Ben, um, first of all, Matrix is the protocol. Riot is the client and one part of it, right? Why don't you well, run us through that real quick? Okay, so, so Riot, Riot is a client. Riot is um, it's certainly the most full-featured, and uh, we might call it the reference uh, client. It's the most popular by far. It comes in uh, web, Android, and iOS flavors. Um, and it's also, you know, it's, 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 um, part of its purpose is to be the flagship part of the SDKs for those platforms so that it, it, it can be used to build on top of uh, those platforms for other clients. But yeah, Matrix is the protocol. Um, anybody can host a home server, but Matrix.org itself is also a very popular home server, and Riot is a client that we provide. And, and by the way, Matrix, so, you know, I, uh, as many of us here, we've been in and out tasting various uh, platforms and protocols. And of course, I've been on Matrix since it, is ex it, it existed, and so mm -hmm. has James. But um, are we encouraging people to get on Matrix, or is it rather um, put your own thing up? Uh, how much room is there on Matrix for new oh, people? I see. So, so you, you mean, should, should people be hosting their own home servers versus should they be coming to our central server? Oh, you should be hosting your own wherever possible. We, we fully encourage it. In fact, so there's been a drive this summer to improve performance on, um, on Synapse, which is the, the, the most popular reference home server. Um, and actually, in the last few weeks, we've been working with people to improve documentation. Um, there's new things like Ansible and Docker containers that will allow people to, 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 you know, to basically to do better DevOps and to do better maintenance because we, we're starting to move from you know, an enthusiast world to a place where you know, your, your, your local sysadmin who previously had no problem in stalling Nginx 
but really struggled with Synapse. Now Synapse is into that space. Okay. That, that's where we're moving. Indeed. And I have to say, Ben, that the whole process has improved immeasurably Good. since the early days. So, so now it's easy, easy enough for anybody to, to install it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So why would somebody want to install something like Matrix? And the question is a big one, not just because, not just the literal part of why would you want to install it, but also what can it do? Because uh, there are, well, there's matrix.org. So you can get on that using Riot, let's say, uh, client, and you could talk to people. But you say you have a train spotting organization or something. All right. So, uh, how would that work? I'm, I'm a train spot. I'm not, but say I am a train spotter. I mean, be. How does that work? I could be. Yeah. How does that work? How would that work? That's a that's an example. Yeah. Bird watching or whatever. Does right. So so you've got your organization, you know, and they're enthusiasts about something or other about um, paleontology or bird watching or, or something. Um, you, you have your website, you have your forum, you want to add a chat capability to this, but you also have people who overlap with other worlds. You know, you've got you've got bird watchers who also watch trains. So you want to be able to connect those worlds together. You want to be able to say, my identity is stored on this server and I'm part of this community in the same way you could do with, with any other thing. So you're part of this forum, you get your email from these, this group, but then you can federate those, um, those servers together and you're not limited um, just to stay on that one server. So this fundamentally is, is part of the value of decentralization. This isn't just something that Matrix provides. This is, this is fundamental to decentralization, which is actually what our, uh, Axel and I have been talking about all afternoon. Um, so yeah, beyond that though, there's the, the aspect of bridging. So if you have colleagues and friends on other platforms, then you can, um, you, you can communicate with those, those people uh, across, across platforms that are not Matrix. So that's anything with an open API. Okay. Uh, go ahead, uh, James. I think you were. Yeah, there's more to it than that because you, you may not be comfortable with somebody like Facebook. Um, yeah, who would work for Facebook? Huh? Um, you, you might not be uh, uh, happy with Facebook yeah. controlling all of your messaging infrastructure. So you, you might want to install your own server. So, for example, you might want to run your own family server. And with Matrix, that's that's easily possible. Yeah. So, so this idea of scale, you, you, your bird watching organization might have some faction where one group is only interested in sparrows, and they want you know sparrows.birdwatchers.org, and they want that to be that to be their their sub server, um, but they still want to be able to talk to the you know swallows group. <laughs> It gets worse, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I love this. This is great. No, that's exactly um, exactly what we're talking about. Um, I, I think that uh, what this is really supposed to be about is the idea of federation, first of all. So let I me. I got to tell you, the swallows guys, they're no good. They're <laughs> no good at all. <laughs> See, yeah. this is what I mean. So the the, the idea of federation. Um, so one thing that we talked about recently was the um, uh, matrix being adopted by the French government for their internal communications. Federation and decentralization is just ideal for them because they've got a series of linked ministries who may or may not get along with each other. And certainly they want separate servers, but they also have to be able to communicate freely. Decentralization yeah, and federation is perfect. Indeed, in order to govern, you need to be able to do that. And, and, and I think it's important to understand, too, that um, in the case of, okay, say Google, uh, Google or Facebook or any of those, you know, they've got a million nodes out there at different edge points, mm -hmm. but, but they're still, it's still all the same thing. The difference here is that people run their own instance. I don't know, what do you call, do you call them instances, by the yeah, way? Yeah, you can say instances, the Synapse instance. In, so instance, uh, to me, instance is you, you've got a server and you set up the software and you're there. In the case of Diaspora, which we're going to be talking about also, Diaspora, they call them pods. But the point is it's, it's a server that's using the protocol. And Matrix is the protocol. Riot is one of the apps of one of the um, agents, yeah, the apps. Um, 
what what other uh, ways are there to talk on Matrix? By the way, what what are the clients? Yeah. So there are yeah yeah so there are yeah great so there are native clients for um, uh, Mac OS. So there's something called uh, 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 Sea Glass. There's um, there's Qt and GNOME apps, and there's even a great community uh, in Qt. Um, we have a, a, um, a, a client library which is used to power basically uh, multiple clients, um, including ones that look some that look like old-fashioned Linux apps, like a cute app, um, and then some that look great because they're actually all the work is really going into the UX and not into the and not into the. If you check out matrix.org, then and click on clients, then you'll find um, a newly updated set of documentation about which clients are available. And basically, uh, what's important to understand, and this is true of all these things, matrix, uh, all protocol, there is a protocol, which is a way to communicate. There's a diaspora, I think it's a diaspora protocol. I don't know what they use, but, um, and the point is that these are protocols that someone can write to, write a client of, or write APIs, write to the API. I hope I'm expressing myself properly. The point is that there is a facility there and you can, from some place, talk to these things. So when we say um, uh, matrix, I could theoretically write something to talk to matrix and came on to matrix uh, instances or whatever. <laughs> again, the pods instance and so on, um, and joined these things, presuming their instances, joined these instances, but it had nothing to do with any of the people who developed Matrix. So that's a published protocol. Am I right? Yeah. So so when we, when we talk about open source and openness and interoperability, it's not just the source code itself, it's the specification which is open. Um, it, yeah, that, that's, that's really the key. Um, and yeah, you... you you're you're sending just JSON over HTTP. It's trivial, almost trivial, for real. And and this goes back to one of the fundamental ways that the internet works, which is basically there are no gatekeepers. This is this is how we communicate together. This is a set of rules we've come up with, and we can talk this way, and that enables so many things. I mean, that's that underpins you know our freedom of expression on the internet because anybody can basically talk the right protocol and send their information mm -hmm. out there. Um, it's really good for innovation. If you have a better way of doing something, yeah. or as you were saying, just a nicer interface, yeah. that's that's innovation. Yeah. So all these things are built in. You know. Well, email is a great example exactly. of this too. It's I mean, Email is fundamentally decentralized. It's just so ubiquitous that we don't bother to mention it even. Um, but the, you, you, you don't think twice about emailing somebody on a different domain. Why would you? But we don't see that for other services. You're on Facebook Messenger. You don't expect to be able to talk to other services. Right. Actually, uh, email did start in a little silo format where you had to find out where people were. But r today, of course, it is. And email is still the lowest common denominator for, to talk to people. Um, but let's compare this with the silos of Facebook or Google, Google Plus, or uh, uh, is it WeMe or MeWe? I can never remember. I think it's MeWe. Um, these are platforms that are centralized and uh, have may or may not have APIs, but they're not global networks in the sense that anyone can use them. For example, Facebook. I mean, Facebook has servers all over the world, I would presume, but they're still not distributed in the same way as, say, Diaspora, Mastodon, or a Matrix. In no, I mean, just, just being globally distributed and having multiple servers is not... Yeah, we don't. We wouldn't consider that to be uh, decentralized at at all. Yeah, we, it's decentralized, but it's not federated. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 And there's uh, so I would say there's a huge amount of um, bickering in the in the world about this about these definitions. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, we 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 use the, the federation to mean synchronization between separate servers. Um, so you're right in that sense that there's no concept of that in, in Facebook brand. Yeah. And, and you know, um, when you quit Facebook, I've heard many people say this. When you quit Facebook, they send you a thing saying, oh, but, you know, you can still use Facebook Messenger even though your account is suspended because basically they don't delete it. They suspend it. Uh, 
but it's still it's priority. It's pri what am I trying to say? Somebody correct me there. Some proprietary, I guess. Proprietary, thank you. But uh, the the point is that Messenger, uh, there's this thing called Fritz. Are you familiar with that? That can talk to a bunch of different places. But the point is, it doesn't. It sort it uses Facebook Messenger, and I think it can use IRC and some other things. But it, it won't talk to everything. Um, so we have a little bit of a problem here. This is the channel problem, the James Bodie channel problem which is how do I talk to James? He has 700 phone numbers. Why would you want to talk? To, oh, it's there, okay. Yeah, good point, good point. Why would you want to talk to James? <laughs> well, for that, that's my point. Why would I ever want to talk to you, Randy? Well, uh, that's the problem. You, you immediately assume that just because you've got my phone number, that gives you the right to disturb me at any time of day or night, and it just doesn't work that way. And how many days. times have I done that, James? Uh, so many. Yeah, no, <laughs> all the time. No, no. The uh, we all know that the uh, the correct protocol these days is you send a uh, a text message to say, "Are you able to talk?" No, no, no. James, James, let me correct that immediately. You send a fax to ask the person if you can then send them a text. So then you the text says, "Can I call you now?" Fax is coming back. We at Tad Summit this week. We heard that fax is the fax is the new thing. Next, this time next year, we're all going to be sending faxes or so. Some well, uh, well, 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 not that, but the, the message was that the, actually the volume of fax traffic had actually gone up, not down, which surprised yeah, but everybody. That's specifically because of James Bodie and these dangerous demos where everybody is faxing QR codes around the planet now. Nothing to do with me. No, I'm totally innocent. Um, but no, no, the, re the real reason for it is that all of a sudden we've got these cloud-based fax systems and there are some really strange regulations in the U US which force you down a fax route. Really? Um, like what? What's Support it called? Come on, Ben. Help me. I, don't, I don't know about the regulations, but there's certain medical and legal things that have yes. to be faxed. And yet, yes. fax is easily uh, counterfeited, just like almost any other technology. Just like all the spoof yeah. uh, phone numbers that you get from phone calls, uh, I get ten of these a day, probably, right. and they're trying to look like neighbors. Yeah. Say again. So I was saying it was not designed with any security in mind or any, yeah. you know, um, digital signature or identity. It's just anybody can send one. Yeah. But I mean, that's the point. Is the irony of of yeah. the legal entities? demanding a fax as a legal proof of anything. I yeah. could send a fax, I mean, any of us could do this, send a fax and make it look like anything. Plus fax resolution is so bad that you could probably just mm -hmm. scan somebody's letterhead, you know. There's usually laws against using other people's letterheads for that specific reason, not for fax specifically, but you know, for, for forgery. And it's specifically for lettered paper, yeah. which is a bit incredible. Sure. Sure, but and, and you know, fax predates Photoshop, right? And that's fundamentally the problem is mm -hmm. it's just so easily photoshopped. Right. Time for the old world. Right. If, if you think about decentralization, there's another interesting example of something that almost took off but didn't for identity, which was um, open PGP keys yep. uh, with the web of trust. People were trying to say, you know, we have our own web of trust. You can a government could sign your key and say, oh, this key is valid, and you could use that with your bank. Your bank could send you encrypted email, which would be signed, so for sure it wouldn't be coming from any yeah. spammy, fishy thing, and that would be very good, except that that was an open standard, and it was never really pushed by any government, because, I don't know, they never got it or whatever. There's new attempts now to be doing this in different ways, but that's another example of you know an open a protocol and an open layer on top that you know had a lot of interesting potential. But, uh, yeah. Totally true, yeah. But that's another, that brings us to back to the silos, which is there is a real battle for people's identity right now on the internet. Facebook wants to be your one identity. Google wants to be your one identity. And their idea is that you know, if they can keep your identity, then everything else is an offshoot of that. So they used to fight for your profile, then they fought for your messaging. But really, the underlying thing is your identity. And if you give that to, you know, to a private you know, for-profit companies, that's going to yield interesting results. So. So that brings us to really, you know, that brings interesting questions in the mix, I find, and, you know, why these silos there, what's their goals? So this is, Jay, I have a question. What is Matrix doing in the realm of identity? Some sort of 
are you working with like sovereign or some sort of self sovereign identity construct? Um, so, so right now, the, the the design of Matrix means that, that anybody can provide uh, an identity server, um, of which there are a few in the wild. It has not been as much of a focus uh, for the Matrix team as as getting the product, um, you know, wider distribution. But there is a specification designed exactly for this purpose. So, it allows a home server to to call on call on a third party, uh, which may which may in fact be self hosted. Um, in order to, to map matrix IDs to other types of third-party ID um, with the eventual goal that you should in future only need the third-party ID and the, the matrix ID should be transparent. Um, in reality today, most people operate with their, with their matrix ID directly. But yeah, it's something, it's something that's solved, uh, intended to be solved at the specification level. Interesting. Thank you. By the way, uh, I was at the uh, Decentralized Web Summit at uh, the beginning of August, and I believe uh, Matthew was there, but that was, the, that was the topic, identity. So it's, it's a huge missing out of the whole ecosystem. Is, yeah, and it was, uh, again, at TED Summit, we had David Diaz, um, you know, mm -hmm. Um, from Protocol Labs, okay. who's responsible Protocol for IPFS, uh, talking about exactly that. And and Jay, if you get a chance, it's well worth going to the TAD Summit um, videos and just looking up that 20-minute talk that David Diaz gave. It was absolutely fascinating. I will do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big missing. And, <clears throat> you know, the identity issue, and this is something I've spent a lot of time on over the years, in naming, addressing, numbering, and identity, particularly in, in the telecom realm, it's it extends beyond just the zeros and ones. It's also a policy issue, and it's also a business model issue that uh, needs to be resolved. So it's it's more nuanced and subtle than it than it appears on, at first uh, glance. Yeah, identity is a really complex issue because for a start, people don't have one identity. They usually have several, and that's a good thing. Uh, we learn as we grow up to say, you know, to show different aspects of our personalities to different people. That's that's helpful in society. Um, and and so we're not really one identity or several. We're just attributes. We're, it's a collection of attributes, and we choose to reveal some to some people and some to others. And so who gets to hold on to that? Historically, for a long time, no one did. No one did. There was no state that backed that up. You were just, you know, who you were according to the people who knew you. Mm. And then over time, mm. we started having registries to know who was alive and who was dead. That is useful. But at this point, we're at the point in time where we have some very, you know, large organization states that yep. do that for you. Yep. And then in the online world, nobody really wants to have a state identity. That's a bit odd. I mean, they do it in some countries, and that's raised a lot of social control questions. Mm -hmm. So some intermediaries for profit, like Facebook or Google, have come into that and are saying, we'll do it for you. Some people also tried to do it in a more open way, like Open ID, but that didn't really take off. Mozilla tried with Persona, that didn't entirely take off. It's a really hard question to solve. So as you were saying, I'm not surprised this is a big talk right now because it's one of the layers of the internet that we haven't solved yet. Yeah. We know how to address content, content, but we don't really know how to address people. So something I didn't ask you when we, we were chatting earlier is, what, what do you think of Solid and, and how that um, you know, but Tim Berners-Lee's new thinking around personal data stores, essentially. So, so what did you say? What's the name? Solid. Uh, solid, right? Yeah, solid. 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 Is, is solid. solid. Yeah. I, well, I don't have a very strong opinion about it so mm -hmm. far because I haven't looked at it in detail. Uh, one of the things I thought was problematic was the fact that it seems to still rely on a third-party service yeah. to tell other people where you are rather than have something that is more neutral and above that, which okay. would just be like an, an exchange layer where people can just put information. All right. It's still dependent on them. Uh, and then it's a full profit, as far as I understand. I, which, I, I don't know Which how is fine. a bit surprising if you're trying to solve like a fundamental problem of the internet, that you wouldn't go for a more protocol type route. Yeah, yeah. there's a company that's attached to it. I don't, I, you know, I yeah. should have looked that up before. I don't know enough about it. I can look it up a bit if you want, but. Um, 
I will look at it. Yeah, I, I suspect the, the best solution here is probably a hybrid one where you've got a mixture of something like um, um, uh, certificates that um, your SSL certificates, which you you can you can get. You have trusted parties there, some of which you pay money to issue you with a certificate. Um, but then um, you can have um, big chunks of um, uh, open sourcing bits in there as well. Um, so one of the big problems with this identity thing, particularly with, with crypto key variables, is what happens when you lo lose your cryptographic key variables? <laughs> That's um, and, and it's something that I've done more than once. You mean your Bitcoin million dollar? Yeah, off? just don't go there. <laughs> it, it causes <laughs> immense pain. Well, this is, this is an area that's, that's right. This is an area that's ripe for innovation, and I think it's an op an opportunity for some of the incumbents to step in and uh, set up a set of services, uh, whereby you've got like a multi signature construct, so you can reconstruct your identity or your uh, private keys if you've got two out of three people that you know, agree to uh, reconstruct that. So that's that's a huge missing piece, James, that I think could be an opportunity for some of the incumbent trusted uh, brands and services and so forth, including AT&T and Verizon and some of the telecoms. Yeah, uh, and, and but, uh, going, down, going down that line, actually then using something like a SIM card uh, as a, repository to put your to look after your cryptographic key variables is possibly a very smart move because you've got in in the form of a of a sim you've got a, a reasonably secure platform which at the same time has access to uh, always on signaling which is always encrypted so um, you can combine both the the key storage with the ability to authenticate um, in real time but now um, that now that um, we've found ways to imitate fingerprints and to do um, deep fakes, which is you know videos and editing and all of that, there, there's almost no good way. I mean, um, well, I, well, I disagree was, with you there. I think I think what you want to do is to have multiple ways of increasing the level of confidence um, in identity. Well, and and in, 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 and to do different things, you probably need to score different levels of confidence. So well, if you can string together three or four different means of um, authenticating, then you, it probably is you. I think you're right, because if you look at, for example, um, what, what passes for two-factor authentication today, uh, as soon as somebody has my phone, two-factor authentication is useless pretty much because... Um, if it's done by, say, the Google app on my phone, well, they got my phone, so they had, know that number. If yeah. it's done by an asset, wait a minute, if it's done by a text, obviously that's a use. Talk about ridiculous. The SMS to your phone for two-factor authentication, I mean, you know, as soon as somebody has your phone, they go, yeah, it's me. And Google's thing often is, is this you asking for blah, blah, blah? Well, yes, it's me. So you click on, you touch the button, and that's the end of it. Um, the circle of trust actually was, was more authentic, but, you know, harder to do because you would have to get, actually meet people in person. The real circle of trust that I know about from years ago, James, what were you going to say? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say the, the big, one of the, the big, um, opportunity meets, uh, from Tad Summit for me was meeting Ms. Stacy Stubblefield, oh. who, uh, not only is, um, a lady, well, that's unusual in this business, isn't it? But uh, but also incredibly bright, and uh, one of the founders of TeleSign, who uh, a company whose prime business is is identity and verifying identity, particularly for two factor authentication. Yeah, let's get and there's a yeah, there's a lot you can do if you can get access to the uh, to the network signaling. Um, you can build up layers of trust um, um, depending on all these things like um, 
uh, device info, um, subscriber mm -hmm. status, current location as well. Off the network, you can you can get a location, and so you can get an element of trust out of physically where you right. are. For that example, doesn't, that doesn't spell yeah, well, it, for me, but what? Yeah, yeah, but it it would not be the one sole um, factor that you use. But when you string together sort of eight or nine different factors. Um, now you eight or nine right? fact. Well, the usual thing was something you have and something you know, right? Is that right? Uh, and it, do you have your key? I mean, the physical. Yeah, key, it, 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 like, to be specific, we're talking about proof of possession, i.e., you actually physically hold something like a key. Proof of being, which could be something like biometrics, voice, face print, mm -hmm. uh, fingerprint. Proof of knowledge. So that that could be. Uh, answer to a, a question: What was your, you? uh, your your mother's inside leg measurement? Ooh, yeah. uh, and, <laughs> well, and there's well, another one, and I can't remember what it is. Anyway, yeah, but this is this is a big challenge, as you say. Um, let's get back to Ben, since we have the privilege of having him with us, and uh, the other okay. gentleman. Um, uh, there's one more thing yeah. from Axel. So. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Sure. Let's just say, yeah, multi-factor authentication. That's always a really interesting one. It's how you pick the factors are, you know, obviously the, the big thing. You can also do something you know how to do, which is a signature, just, just putting it out there. It's one of the other ones that is often forgotten. Um, it's also important to remember that there's a difference between authentifying, proving that you have the right to do something, and identifying, proving who you are. One often comes before the other, but not necessarily, and not all systems need to know who's using them. They just need to know if the person using them has the right to do that. And that separates the, you know the, the question again in, se in se several ways because sometimes you just need to know the person has decent access for yeah. private reasons it can be really interesting yeah. to that's a great that's a great point <clears throat> yeah, that i think is often overlooked in this space generally when we talk about identity we talk about trying to prove definitively prove that we know the identity of who we're interacting with when if you really look at the identity space, we need the full spectrum from definitive identity to anonymity. Hmm. In my view. They, all have, they all have their uses and they should all, you know, it's important to remember. Um, some say that anonymity is the only condition for true freedom of expression. I'm not sure I entirely agree, but there is, there is some element of truth there. Um, but at the end, I think going back to what you were saying also before about, you know, how do you identify people and who can identify, um, you can look at it also like who should you have to rely on? Do you have to rely on certain actors for all your identities? Do you, you know, for your driving license, it'll probably be necessary for the state to say, you know, to prove who you are. But for an online community, everybody might be sure of who you are, but that might go entirely through your own channels or through, you know, cooperative channels of, of collection of matrix services or, you know, Mastodon instances or diaspora instances. Like these many grained levels are complicated to, to, to lay out. So I think it's, I, I, we are very attached. I mean, I know I'm very attached to this idea that you should be able to roll your own version of it if you really want to, if you're in a situation where you have to, that's something open source makes possible. Say, if you're a journalist organization, are you sure you can really trust another private actor or even the state? Sometimes you just can't. You, you just can't because what you're reporting on is too sensitive. And it would be naive to think that you always can because we live in great, wonderful Western countries. We yeah. have there, there, are, there are two key elements of legacy sovereignties that now are on the table for disruption. Uh, number one is we've relied upon our sovereignties, our geographic sovereignties and so forth, to provide our identity. And number two, we've relied upon our geographic sovereignties to provide our currency. Now, both of those two items are on the table for disruption through this decentralized ecosystem that we're all interested in building. And that has some <laughs> huge implications from uh, you know, economic and political and sociological viewpoint. So you know, these are really, really key elements that we're talking about. I wanted to mention, uh, bouncing off something you just said, uh, which was that my wife can imitate my signature perfectly, so it saves me hours and hours of time. But in other words, this is someone who has the authority to execute uh, what needs to be done for me. But online, it just, um, you know, we, 
we there's some um, some chat in the background here about open ID, for example. What happened to open ID? Apparently, it's dead, as far as I know. Um, letting Google or Facebook sign into stuff for you seemed like a good idea at the time, but in the last year or so, I've totally given that up. I mean, I, I think that's an absolutely idiotic idea uh, to relegate. Is that the right word? Or delegate? Maybe delegate. Uh, your identity to, well, to Facebook of all people, but even Google. Um, it's easy, but now I use email, and I generally try to assign specific emails to each thing that I'm using. So we have a, actually, we use a Google Apps, whatever it's called, G Suite this week. Um, so I can assign, I mean, if it's going to be Matrix, for example, if I sign into Matrix, I can sign in as matrix at my domain dot thing. And um, then I'll know exactly where the spam came from, if it is from them, or I'll know what it all is from. So in other words, my recommendation, and you know, you're welcome to agree or disagree, would be to use email and stop using all these, these surrogate IDs, even though it looks easy, it's crazy. Because once you leave Facebook, first of all, you're dead. And second of all, um, who knows what they're doing in the background with these tokens. Uh, Matrix. Um, again, I want to get back to Matrix because you're here, Ben, and, and uh, it's important. Uh, there are centers of interest, I noticed, looking at, say, rooms. I'm mm -hmm. trying to get my head around Matrix, by the way, and a, a riot anyway, and it's not as obvious as it probably should be. Yeah, so there's a new UI release coming uh, presently. Right, but I mean, you, you can look for rooms and theoretically at least what I would think that meant was if I'm interested in a dental implants or something, if there's such a room, yeah. you know, I look for it, right. uh, whatever, some crazy, you know, orth ornithology, yeah. uh, Charlie Parker's, you know, scales, whatever it is, because let's face it, that's what the internet is good at. It's yeah. on is, is going to be a problem with these, with these networks. Yeah. I mean, so right now um, that we have the room directory, which allows you to search across um, across different home servers. But yeah, you're, you're going to struggle a little to search across the whole federation, um, not least because in order to make a true directory, you would need to really centralize that. Otherwise, you're, what are you doing? you're sending out the same search to multiple home servers, simply not scalable. In order to make a true directory, I think what we'd like to see is a third party directory which makes the query against home servers and then is integrated against each client not against each home server that would be the that would be the best solution um it's yeah it's just on a long list of things that need to be done i agree and and i think shake and bake is the idea here in other words it, it can be updated once every three hours once every day whatever yeah, yeah. Uh, this would be really good it's a great idea we always need somebody who wants to spend the time doing it for free. Well, you know, we, we're going to come. I mean, I, I know that you guys have been hearing this for a while, but we are going to come to a point of stability of features with Matrix. Um, in the next, you know, this year, we'll, 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 we hope to make the 1.0 release um, of the specification, after which point then these kind of uh, sugary features can, can, can be prioritized because until now it's been, uh, yeah. Just getting it running has been the challenge. But, uh, so, as, just adding a small thing to what Ben just said, the fact that you can't find everyone on the network is not a problem. To, it's probably more a feature than anything else. Because that's, on the contrary, one of the problems of centralized services is that two people have a conversation, and then 15,000 people come up that were not in the conversation and start attacking them. And we've been seeing this over and over on Twitter, uh, and that's mm -hmm. a huge problem. And not saying it's great that, you know, it's obviously going to be problematic if you're looking for that one room about how to bake cakes in a certain way and you can't find it. That's annoying. But on the other hand, not everything needs to be part of the general, you know, knowledge of who yeah. is talking. It's privacy is also interesting in that respect. And so when, we come, when we come to directories, we don't have to run it on Matrix. The best directories we've seen until now have essentially been websites, static websites that... that you know, Matrix doesn't have to solve every problem. Twitter doesn't need to solve every problem. It's it's a case of it's a case of using the best tools. We already have the web, which is a great tool for making directories. Right. Okay, we're ping. 
we're disrupting James by pinging him constantly. Um, guys, I really wanted to talk a little bit about this diaspora and other social, uh, other um, open source social, uh, I hate to say network, social network, because that means a thing. And I don't think, I don't think Matrix, Matrix being a protocol, I don't think Riot and company are actually a social network per se. Mm -hmm. But my point is really, how do we communicate? And I started this by mentioning that I can't get a hold of James even through his phone numbers because he blocks me out. We we both have 20 phone numbers and so on. Anyway, um, I would like to uh, get into a little bit about what it means to be talking to people through open source as compared to Facebook. Because Facebook, Messenger, and even Google Hangouts and so on, everybody's trying to be your one place to gather, one, one way to talk. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone if I say that I'm really not co that comfortable in having a corporation run that. Mm -hmm. I think we all feel that way. So we've got things like Matrix, we've got things like Diaspora, which is which is even a wider thing because mm -hmm. there's uh, the Diaspora, whatever protocol they use, maybe it's Diaspora protocol, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, there's tons of pods out there. Diaspora has existed since 2010. And I think I and my cohorts have been on it since 2010, but we go in there once a year to check. Uh, Diaspora has gotten some uh, push as Google Plus has indicated yeah. the sunset. But the point is, anyway, Facebook's out of the question for a lot of people, including me. I have no truck, no interest in Facebook. So no interest in Facebook Messenger. So what's the next step? We also, we communicate on Wire, but Wire isn't open source and it isn't a hugely public thing. Uh, we also communicate on via Matrix and uh, Riot, although I'm not on there every day. Um, what are we going to do about all this? Yeah, so you're describing the problems of network effects. Um, yeah, you, they don't. People don't come until their friends are there, and then how do you how do you bootstrap that problem? Yeah, I mean, do you want to speak to this? Because <laughs> yeah, we don't know. You know, it's it's really hard. I mean, network effects is exactly what you're describing. I have a diaspora account too. I go there once a year to check what other people are doing. You want to go where people are, but that has a good that has some good sides because you find the people you need. But it turns out, like, so there's this law called Metcalf's law, I think, after the guy who came up for it, uh, which is the value of a of a network. Um, I think is squared for every every person you add or something. So essentially, that actually does break down after a while because most people don't really want to communicate with more than 100 to 150 people. So the question then becomes, do we really need a centralized network that is huge and has everyone where you can find them, or do you want sub-networks where you can find most of the people you want? Now, everybody's 150 people want to be the same, so they need to interoperate, yeah. which is exactly what we were describing. Yes. But it does, you know, those, those whole questions of the network effect, everybody at the same place or not. The other downside of centralized places is that um, it's extremely good for spreading uh, misinformation. Um, also for spreading good information, that is clearly the case. But we have now this extra layer of, you know, people circulating, uh, you know, poorly informed data in some of these channels. And, and that's, of course, then a temptation for some centralized actors to say, we'll solve this, we'll mm -hmm. check what everybody's doing on these channels, and we'll report or we'll censor. And then you get into a whole realm of private censorship with companies like Facebook or Google saying, well, we'll police this environment when the states think they can't. I mean, mm -hmm. all of this gets into a real, real mess. Yeah, and you end up with the state delegating the, the, the act of moderation to private companies. Often, in the, you know, in the case of the EU, you're, you're delegating it to a foreign private entity which is the last thing I think that, 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 that they want to be doing. Mm. Um, but they don't have the capacity to do it themselves. So, so they end up willing to do it. Yeah. So what do you do? Do you put everyone in the same place and centralize it, have these giant directories where everybody is there controlled by like one giant gatekeeper, mm -hmm. which doesn't sound very nice. And as you were saying, if Facebook is that gatekeeper, a lot of us don't want that to be the case because they don't have, you know, they don't, they're not accountable to pretty much anyone. Yeah. Uh, or the other hand is do you have a lot of smaller entities that it might be harder to police, but might self, you know, self-regulate better, or yeah. at least if you don't like the community you're in, you can move out. Yeah, it's it's not obvious, but I think the reg the, the the decentralized model 
at least avoids a lot of the pitfalls of the centralized model and was the original model of the internet. I mean, we shouldn't forget that. So yeah, mm. yeah no, that's the legacy. There's, of a, there's a term called uh, tenure uncertainty. And that comes into play where, you know, we're investing ourselves in these different addresses and different platforms. For example, IRC, where, you know, all of a sudden the game can change and the platform becomes at best less usable, if not unusable, or somebody can yank the address that we built up a certain amount of branding and momentum and you know time and effort and content on and and that becomes a big cost if we're dealing with any kind of construct in naming addressing and numbering and identity that has an element of tenure uncertainty to it um it's it's a big big problem so you're coming back to self-sovereign identity essentially that's the one answer currently to solve that bit mm -hmm. and that's not done but it has promised so I'm going to have right. to, unfortunately. Uh, but thanks a lot for having me. It's Excellent. a real pleasure. Yeah, great. Man. And, um, it was really, yeah, it was really great to chat. Yeah. Um, Talk right. to you soon. Sorry to this, <laughs> to this way. Yeah. Hey. Well, thank yeah, Ben. It's great to see you after so long. I haven't seen you for at least a day. And a half. Yeah. So James and I were at Tad Summit earlier in the week. Um, I have to. Bye bye. And there he was. Suddenly, Jay was gone too. Okay. Um, well, James, why are you asking me how many followers I have? Well, just out of interest, we're talking about uh, numbers of um, the Metcalf law. Metcalf no, you're law. talking about the Dunbar number of 150. No? No, Metcalf's law. I Metcalf? Think. Who's Metcalf? I know Carol Metcalf. She's a comedian, actress. But, um... Well, Ben just explained it to you. Uh, no, I. Yeah, you probably weren't listening. What I know, time. yeah. Well, I was kind of listening, but the but the the number I know is Dunbar, which is Dunbar. 150 people are the number of people that the theory is that you could communicate with online comfortably. So um, BNC has got six thousand followers. That's a look. At least, yeah. Uh, I've had I, I had a collection on Google Plus that had 450 thousand followers. So uh, visions under construction. Vision, no, I had a VUC. I no, I had a collection on Google Plus, and on Google Plus, my profile has supposedly has sixteen thousand and, and more followers, but I challenge that saying that there are probably less than a thousand, and that those numbers come from zombies, basically people who okay, six thousand three hundred one. Yeah, well, if you follow it, it'll be six thousand three hundred two. The point is that none of that matters. And by the way, the uh, one of the people who is very bright about this stuff said, and it's 100 percent true, it doesn't matter how many people, how many followers you have. It depends on who they are. Indeed. So, yeah. you know, if you were trying to be, I don't know. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. The important thing is that I tried as hard as I could to get diaspora people on and uh, was unsuccessful. But Ben, I'm so glad that you joined us because we've also been on our knees. I saw Matthew at ComCon in UK last, God, it was nine months ago now, right, James? No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. It was during no, the summer. Six months. Well, four, five. Three, how about three months? Well, well anyway, time, yeah, time we're time is quite we're a variable there. thing. Anyway, whatever. The point is we've uh, had a long-time relationship with – Matrix and Matthew, and he's been on a million times. And I, I know there's many, many things to do. So we're, I'm really pleased that you were able to join us. And sure. actually, Matrix has become the main topic, in a sense, uh, along with some of the ancillary, like uh, authentication and who you are and so on. But yeah. great. That's great. We love that. We improvise. Just, just one more point on your um, idea of the, 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 num the importance of the net number of followers versus the quality of followers. This is something that the advertising industry is independently discovering, I think, you know, quite, quite apart from the, you know, human value. It's the, if just because an influencer, so-called, has thousands of followers, it, it, it may mean nothing. Yep. And this is, you know, we, 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 we don't need to mourn advertisers wasting their money, but they will, um, as they start to complain about this, bring the whole problem into more public view. So that's a, that's a good thing. But I, I think that it's worth saying, I don't think I said this already, who knows? Because in the state I'm in, I don't know. I may repeat myself. But 
The point is that on something like Instagram, which is the epitome of the shit I don't like on the internet, by the way. Uh, so you've, you know, you have people who are influencers. Some are paid. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of the really high profile people are paid a lot of money, like thousands or even millions of dollars to post, well, I'm doing this today, you know, actors and models and so on. Um, but, you know, that's all meaningless, except for the fact that they have these huge numbers and they're famous. So they're famous lifestyle, peop lifestyle people. Mm -hmm. um, the point is that when we, those of us who are sitting here talking about federated networks and we care about open source, are the antithesis of that, and we don't care about that. I mean, if Linus, what's his name, said, well, I use this deodorant, you know, I could give a shit. I don't really care. Uh, I use whatever I want, and I think that that's the case of almost everybody. So the, the whole influencer idea is, is, is you know, null and void as far as I'm concerned, but it's imp super important on superficial networks like Instagram, mm -hmm like um, to an extent Facebook. These are pretty much the sewers of all that is political memes and useless crap, right, basically. When we talk about, by the way, I was sorry to interrupt. There was actually people talking about something interesting on a riot and I jumped into a couple of channels uh, to grab people and I grab you, man. So that's great. But I actually probably was right in the middle of some actual discussion of something that mattered. So I felt bad about that. Point is, um, you, <laughs> these are things that matter. These are people who are connecting on a different level as opposed to say the Instagram thing, which is a big stream of photos of people who are about to fall off the cliff and die and stuff like that. So, you know, that's, that's the difference between open source, which has no agenda, mm -hmm. maybe being, hopefully being excellent. I'm guessing that's the agenda or just providing a service. Anyway, big difference. And it's important to me. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't know if it's, I don't know how you decide the value of, of communications. You know, we, if 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 there were if there were people using uh, you know a matrix home server to distribute their you know modeling photos, then uh, you know we, we wouldn't we wouldn't want to consider that um, you know a, a lower thing than, than people bickering about C lib. Uh, yep. you know, it's um, yeah. So I, I don't I don't know I don't know I, I don't know I don't know how you how you um, give give, uh, give a value to each thing. I grant the the. You know the the vapidity of, of influences is a problem, but it's still communication of a kind. But you just you just put your finger on it because in a distributed in a federated network, you know you have your pod or your instance. Mm -hmm. If the instance is about modeling or the instance is about photography, which boy, are there not enough photographers on the internet? By the way, um, if that's what it is, then that's that's a hundred percent excellent. That's not a problem. What I'm saying, and I think this is this is you put your finger on the whole difference between uh, open source independent stuff and the Instagrams and Facebooks of this world is that they're the interest in this has to do with commercial or non-commercial. And even if there was an instance of modeling for commercial reasons, it's still an instance and not a general, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I see that's a good counter. Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah, that's good. Super important to me. I mean, I don't want to have people shove their photos down my, listen, there's, this is a thing on the internet. People publish their photos. At, you know, 40 years ago, photography was a big thing. Now everybody's got an iPhone 10. So, you know, you could take photos at night now, apparently, with the Pixel 3. Um, this is all great. And I think, you know, it's you still have to be a, somewhat of an artist to take decent photos. But to see photo after photo after photo after photo after photo after photo on some of these um, non-distributed networks is, you know, there's no value in it. When I say, you know, you asked about value. When I say about value, I'm talking about that. I'm talking about targeting in the sense of my interests. So if I join a saxophone forum, which I'm on, two of them, that stuff is interesting to me. And, you know, some posts may not be of interest, but at least the general field is there. If you're on Instagram, 
you don't have, you need to go get a life if you're on Instagram, because Instagram is just a series of people showing you their lives for better or worse. And, and James and I, by the way, know very well a guy who does this stuff and that's wonderful for him, but I'm not interested in seeing his day-to-day -day life. What do I care? You know? So this is a huge difference between what people like Matrix and Di the, pe the people who are developing Diaspora and uh, Macedon, who we had on um, last year. This is a huge difference, and I appreciate what you guys are doing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, we're going to continue. This, <laughs> this is what we're doing now. Excellent. James, what do you got to say for yourself? Because we're up to the hour just about, and I've been ranting for half of that, so... Well, I, I'm just amazed at how um, the Matrix pro uh, project continues yeah. to evolve. The sheer complexity of what Matthew and Amandine started is breathtaking. And uh, when I first saw what they were trying to do, I thought, wow, this is big stuff. If you could achieve this, you're doing well. And here we are, what, four or five years later. And... And it's all getting there. It's an incredibly ambitious and wonderful project. So well done, Matthew. Well done, Amandine. Uh, we're with you every step of the way. I agree totally with that. And well done, Ben. And well done, Ben. Ben, you've yeah, been waiting. I took the job. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ben. You my role is to try and get more people involved, you know, make it more open. That's the that's my involvement. Well, let's keep that happening. Okay, I just want to mention, because I reserved my accommodations in flight, James, what do we have here? You're, you're, well, yes, you're wearing your Camayo. Camayo. And what have I got on my phone? There it is. There it is. And what have I got on my laptop? You probably have a hotel booking in Berlin. I do, but what's on my laptop? I'm not reading that. Oh, come on. You can read yeah. that. It says IPv6 is the like, shit. Yeah, the, the, the dog's gonads, I think it's probably a better way. Anyway, um, that's Ole's. So Ole's so, going to be there. Everyone well, who, about time too. And and you know what? Now is the time to book your BA City Breaks, guys, because everything is super cheap at this moment in time. The prices will go up. So book now, and you're probably looking at, a, from UK, uh, a total package cost about i don't know 250 280 quid including the hotel so let's so, pass that on to amandine and to matthew and ben if you want to come you're certainly welcome yeah ben, you, better you, come. Need to be there. you need to be there because um can I a word it's one of those uh key events it's a bit like ted summit actually where people self-select themselves to be there everybody who comes to these events is incredibly useful in their own way and just to be there just to meet people you haven't met before is marvelous. Absolutely. And you get all these wonderful people like Stacy Stubblefield. Stacey, and by the way, you, no you one need to be on here. Why has no one asked what this is? It's my ticket to Mars. Uh, uh, with that. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, you know what? It's you know. So yeah, sometimes I worry, Randy. I really do. I need to go up and make the chicken now. The sauce is done. Uh, but the uh, courgette and potato... Uh, I think in France the, the phrase is roule ma poule. I'm not sure that I got that, but I think there's only poule. one thing left to say, if, if I may, James. I think there's only one place to go. Ben, you can hang out for a minute if you want. Uh, but this is the close, so... No, now the red head... Ah, here it is. 1900 hours. Here we go. Yeah.